We'll continue with the lecture now looking at the effects of global warming on fields populations and what you will see is that we will be using the concepts that we have defined so far, specifically the concept of aerobic scope. Mm -hmm. This is not new to you because you understand that actually we can determine, we can quantify the limitations to oxygen uptake. And in a way, you have done this earlier. We have done this in problems. We have discussed this earlier as well. Remember that oxygen consumption is the product of cardiac output times the difference, the oxygen extraction from the blood, the arterial minus the venous. Mm -hmm. Understanding these, basically, you have limitations if we are talking about fish at the level of the gills. Mm -hmm. At the level of the gills, you have a diffusion limitation that basically may prevent the fish from uptaking enough oxygen. But then we have also uh, limitations at the level of extraction from the tissues. And finally, we have another limit, another potential limitation at the level of the heart. This is what's shown here. The heart is an important element because the one that's pumping is the cardiac output. If the heart is limiting, we may not be able to support the same oxygen consumption. Or if the tissues are not extracting equally well or in the gills, then the imbalances here in the extraction through the gills or in the download to the tissues that can be affected as well. Mm -hmm. So this is important. And then basically what we are trying to understand now is how temperature can have an effect on aerobic scope. But aerobic scope is simply oxygen consumption. So of course, effects on aerobic scope may be due to changes or problems with the transport in the heart or with actually the extraction in the gills or the download in the tissues. Mm -hmm. Essentially, different species have different strategies when facing temperature changes. Mm -hmm. You have generalist animals and you have specialists. And I'll give you an example in the last lecture here. But generalists are animals that actually can tolerate a wide temperature margin and they do rather well. So when mean a physiological variable, this could be oxygen consumption. Mm -hmm. This is an animal that basically within a rather broad temperature margin, it's doing fine. And a specialist is an animal that actually has a much narrower margin. If you want a pure specialist, you would have to look for Antarctic fish. Antarctic fish at minus 1.86 degrees centigrade, they are specialists to that temperature. Outside of, uh, outside of that temperature, they generally perform less, even if we know that that's not the case in measurements that have been done. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that an animal have more uh, wider or narrower margins of tolerance to different temperatures. And this is now, we go back in the definition of what's called the oxygen and capacity limited thermal tolerance theory. This is connected directly with the aerobic scope concept that we talked about. That. So this is not new to you now, standard metabolic rate versus the maximal metabolic rate. And notice that the difference between these two is what we have called aerobic scope. If you now plot the difference between these two curves here, you have the scope for aerobic performance. And in this scope, you have an optimal temperature. This optimal temperature would be here, which corresponds to this maximal for maximum metabolic rate uh, in relation to a standard metabolic rate. So the idea is that when you do these measurements, there seems to be there is an optimal temperature at which aerobic scope is maximized. Above this temperature, above this tem optimal temperature, a standard metabolic rate, the standard metabolic rate, increases more than the maximum metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. The concept or the, the, the theory posed uh, by the OCLTT theory that Tony Farrell and Hans Otto Porner have defined basically justifies this drop in performance due to perfusion limitations. What do they mean by perfusion limitations? The heart is limiting. The heart is unable to pump enough blood, therefore cardiac output drops. So the idea behind the OCLTT theory is that fish have an optimal performance over a certain range. And when these fish are moved outside of this, of this best or optimal performance, particularly towards higher temperatures, 
then the heart is not able to pump enough blood and aerobic scope decreases. Aerobic scope decreases because the heart is not sufficient in pumping oxygen, in pumping nutrients. Mm -hmm. The thermal tolerance, the thermal tolerance of these animals is actually limited by limitations at the level of the ventilation and the cardiovascular system to meet the increasing oxygen requirements of the tissues at the high temperatures. That's with what the OCLTT theory has defined, and this has been a very fruitful theory to discuss the effects of global warming. Because now, all of a sudden, if the oceans are actually warming up, we can try to predict how different species may be affected by that by measuring the aerobic scope of these species. And we can expect that animals that are more of the generalist type will do fine unless they are pushed too high, but animals that are specialists may do less well. Mm -hmm. Do we have any evidence for it? Well, there is evidence for and against. I'm going to present mostly evidence for, but there is more mounting evidence coming out in the, in the last few years that are suggesting that this may not be a general theory that can be useful. But this is a beautiful example that I can actually refer, uh, refer to. Notice in this example, basically, this is the, if you know a little bit about geography, this is the west coast of Canada. This is Vancouver Island, where Vancouver sits. Basically, the United States border would be rather down here, close to Seattle. And in this, uh, in this part of British Columbia, you have actually the Fraser River, which is one of the most uh, known salmon rivers in the world. Mm -hmm. This um, salmon, the salmon in this actually river have been studied for many, many years. There's a lot of uh, research going on in here. So that it's possible or it's well defined that there are different populations, different salmon populations in this river that actually you are shown by different colors. You know that salmon return, return and spawn, lay eggs, in the same place they were born, and that basically from here, the point where the river encounters the ocean, the, the Pacific Ocean, these animals basically will have to return to their spawning grounds. But notice, and that's very interesting, is that some populations have a short way to go, while some of the populations have a very long way to go. Mm -hmm. Researchers have been able to study the, these different populations and have determined th that there are differences between them. And notice what they have found here. Uh, what you have here are six different populations that you could locate based on the colors. Chilco is the blue one. Early Stewart is actually the, the longest uh, travelers there. Quesnel is the in green. Nechaco, well, and basically all this is for the same species of salmon. That, uh, the sockeye salmon. These, these are sockeye salmon. It's actually written here. Mm -hmm. Notice <coughs> that in these graphs, what is actually shown is the aerobic scope curve. The aerobic scope curve in different colors. Uh, in this case, it's actually the colored curve. And in green here. The aerobic scope curve actually uh, compared with the temperatures. These are average river temperature encountered by fish. So basically what you have here is a sort of an indication of what's the temperature in the actual river or in the different parts of the river where these populations are found. And what you see basically is that there are important, important differences in the aerobic scope curve for the different populations. For the different populations. I think that, yeah. Here you have now basically uh, some correlations the aerobic scope correlated with the distance, the migration distance. The earliest toward are those fish that had to migrate longest. The weaver had to migrate shortest. What happens with the aerobic scope? Notice that the animals that travel fur, uh, furthest are the animals that have the largest aerobic scope. Interestingly, these are also the animals that have close to the largest hearts. This is the relative ventricular mass. So animals that travel long 
have a higher aerobic scope and have actually a higher ventricular mass, a higher, um, a, a larger, a larger heart. Hmm? Well, basically, this will show the same thing down down here or uh, complementary information. This is interesting. This is relevant. Different fish populations belonging to the same species, based on actually their history and where they have to end up, are able to perform differently. Mm -hmm. And they also that this is also adjusted to the actual temperature that these uh, these uh, fish populations are seeing. Mm -hmm. Another example in relation with this has to do with the concept of oxygen minimum zones and fish distribution. It's not only temperature that matters, but temperature has effects on other biological uh, or, other, uh, or other parameters. In this case, this is actually showing the uh, Atlantic Ocean between Africa and South America. And what you see in this, in the colored graph, is basically, let's see what this is expressed, depth dissolved. This is the amount of oxygen So what this map is showing is actually at which point in the oxygen layer you have an oxygen concentration of 3.5 milliliters per liter dissolved oxygen. In red, basically shows those zones where the oxygen, this concentration of oxygen is found highest up. Mm -hmm. In blue, it's where it's deepest down. So what you see here is that oxygen, an oxygen concentration of 3.5 milliliters per liter is closer to the surface, uh, close to the coast of Africa. Does this have an effect on the fish populations? Does this have an effect on fish performance? And that's basically what this uh, paper is trying to respond uh, by and measurements. And what you see here, this, uh, these researchers have actually tagged different animals these are marlins, this is a marlin, and by tagging these animals they can determine basically where, how deep do these animals uh, actually uh, swim. And what you notice here is that animals, these marlins, prefer the oxygen rich zones. By taking this map together with the distribution of the animals that they are able, they are able to compose a picture of which is the oxygen concentration in which these animals are found. And notice this is an interesting uh, dive measured here, that this uh, in yellow, if you can see it, basically you see the position of the fish. Notice that the fish in, these are different days from the 10th of May down to the 19th of June, every 10 days. Notice that the fish actually follows almost the oxygenated layers that it finds in the water it rarely goes into the very dark red zone. Hmm? It only goes deep when actually oxygen levels are richer, and that happens by the end here. Hmm? What this is showing basically is that these fish actively choose zones of higher oxygen. Of course, they are not stupid. They know where they have to go. Hmm? And this is actually in connection also with temperature. So e temperature has an effect on oxygen concentration and that actually affects these fish, fish distributions. Because if the fish actually goes in curse into this scenario, it's going to be hypoxic, it's not going to get the oxygen that it actually requires. And the, the, the fish opts for not doing that and actually finding more oxygenated areas. Questions? <coughs> 